in the previous video, which is linked in the show description, we looked at some of the driving causes behind chronic neuroinflammation. In today's video, we'll be looking at some of the nutritional supplements, other natural substances and nutrients, which are potentially going to be useful for someone suffering from this kind of condition. Now, I want to emphasize that this is not to replace the necessity for finding the driving cause and addressing that via other means. This is merely to provide support for the brain, support for the blood-brain barrier, and to modulate the immune system to provide some temporary support. The strategies that we'll be looking at are going to be to reduce neuroexcitotoxicity, to reduce neuroinflammation, and to improve energy metabolism. So first of all, let's look at some of the amino acids which have been shown to be helpful in the case of neuroinflammation. These have all been studied and there is a good body of literature for each of them. So the first one is taurine. Next we have N-acetylcysteine, L-theanine, GABA and glycine. So taurine has some very interesting research behind it. It is known to reduce excitotoxicity primarily by reducing the amount of glutamate and it has the inhibitory effect of targeting GABA and glycine receptors. This exerts a, an inhibitory effect on neurons. It increases the GABA levels in the brain. It has a direct anti-inflammatory effect by decreasing the amount of pro-inflammatory cytokines and it has been protective in brain injury and traumatic brain injury. Another way in which it is counteracting this neuroexcitotoxicity is by reducing the calcium ion flux. So essentially reducing the calcium ion concentrations, um, which have this excitatory effect. And in that way, it calms down the brain. It's also been shown to directly inhibit or inactivate microglial cells, which, as you remember, are responsible for initiating this inflammatory response. Next, there is N-acetylcysteine. Again, this is another amino acid with a lot of literature behind it. NAC is a direct precursor for the antioxidant glutathione. Glutathione is a tripeptide. NAC provides cysteine in a bioavailable form which readily crosses the blood-brain barrier and has been shown to increase uh, the levels of glutathione in the brain. Furthermore, NAC can act as a direct antioxidant in its own right, and it also has heavy metal chelating abilities or chelating abilities for transition metals, which are often one of the drivers of oxidative stress because they're highly reactive. NAC was shown to protect the integrity of the blood-brain barrier via several different mechanisms and also modulates NMDA receptors and reduces the concentration of glutamate like, like taurine. Now, this is one of the reasons why it has been shown to be effective um, in neuropsychiatric conditions, including bipolar, depression, even schizophrenia. And finally, like taurine, it also has a, um, an anti-inflammatory in effect in the brain by reducing specific cytokines. Another amino acid which you are probably familiar with is called L-theanine. Now, this is a non-proteinogenic amino acid, meaning that we do not actually incorporate this into our own proteins, um, but this does exert physiological effects. It is found in green tea, and this is what most people associate L-theanine with, but in supplemental form in quite a high dose. Again, the bioavailability is very impressive, and it does also readily cross the bl blood-brain barrier, so it can get into the brain, and it can have clinical utility. It acts um, to increase the endogenous antioxidant system in the brain. So there is research showing it does increase glutathione levels. It does increase superoxide dismutase and catalase. Uh, there's a lot of research looking at L-theanine's ability to improve cognition and memory, but also looking at its ability to reduce that excitotoxicity. So interestingly, theanine can directly bind to NM, NMDA receptors and glutamate receptors to essentially block the action. So it blocks the action of glutamate. One thing to consider is that theanine can actually go on to produce glutamate in the liver. So for some people, if they notice like a, a kind of toxic 
feeling or a stimulating feeling from L-theanine, then it might mean that that's what's happening. So I would advise caution with this particular amino acid. However, I rarely see that that's going to be a problem. And finally, what we see is that like everything else, it does have a neuro anti-inflammatory effect. There is also GABA or gamma amino butyric acid. Now, for those who are not aware, GABA is really the opposing neurochemical to glutamate. We have this glutamatergic system, glutamate system in the brain, which is responsible for excitation. GABA, on the other hand, is responsible for inhibition. So when we have excessive glutamate release from neurons in this hyperexcitability, GABA is one of the ways in which our brain is going to turn that down. It turns everything down and it calms the system. So it's the primary inhibitory system in the brain and it directly antagonizes the effect of glutamate. Now GABA has been studied heavily for its effect on mood and cognition and also neuropsychiatric conditions, but it plays a central role in the uh, brain immune system as well. Finally, there is glycine. So glycine like GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's also an amino acid, but it acts as a neurotransmitter in both the brain and the spinal cord. It has been found to be protective, it has neuroprotective effects in stroke, in intracerebral hemorrhage, in neuropsychiatric conditions. It's been used in very high doses for schizophrenia, for instance. It has been found to prevent neurodegeneration or to have some kind of a protective effect on neurodegenerative conditions. It does have an effect on the inflammatory response in the brain. It does reduce the uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, in increasing anti-inflammatory cytokines and things. Um, so it's another very useful tool. I would also advise some kind of some caution when using glycine because some people who are very sensitive they tend to have quite strong reactions to glycine and it actually seems to have more of an excitatory effect in their brain. Um, and so again, see how one actually reacts to it and then decide what to do because it doesn't always have a calming effect on everyone that's useful. Other nutrients which have a research behind them, which are part of the kind of protocols that I use for people who have neuroinflammation. A lot of the research has been looking at uh, omega-3 fatty acids. There is phosphatidylcholine, there is uh, thiamine, and I prefer the form thiamine tetrahydrofurfal disulfide, TTFD, because this does make its way into the brain so effectively. And there is also magnesium, which cannot be overstated in this situation. Without going into all of the details by which omega-3 works in the brain, I would reference this paper, which was published in 2019, it's titled Omega-3 Polyunsaturated Fatty Acids and the Resolution of Neuroinflammation. In that paper, they detail all of the ways by which the uh, breakdown products of omega-3 fats, breakdown products called resolvins, maresins, and protectins. And so what these essentially do is they put a stop on the inflammatory response. You probably also know that the brain in particular has a very high concentration of polyunsaturated fats. And with people's long-term consumption of vegetable oils and industrial farmed uh, animals, we have a much higher concentration of omega-6 in the diet than would ordinarily be optimal. Even if it is just supplementation for a couple of weeks, I'm not a massive fan of omega-3 supplementation. However, I find in people who do have roaring neuroinflammation, it does help significantly. Speaking of the neural membranes, if we're looking at the cell membrane, we see that it's made up of the phospholipids very high concentration of polyunsaturated fats, but also very high concentration of different types of phospholipids. And these are quite susceptible to the effects of inflammation, to the effects of reactive oxygen species. Not only does it damage the very uh, vulnerable fatty acids, but also damages the phospholipids. And one of the things that can contribute towards ongoing inflammation is actually these damaged fats in the brain. And if the, the body does not have sufficient resources to replace them or to replenish what's lost, 
then ultimately this can kind of prolong inflammation longer than is necessary. And so this is part of the protocol which is recommended by Andrew Heyman. Uh, it's essentially got a great emphasis on lipid replacement therapy using phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine can go on to form into other kinds of phospholipids and is very useful at actually providing the raw material to reconstruct uh, cell membranes so that they start functioning efficiently and as they originally should do. And just briefly looking at the actions of magnesium in the brain, magnesium blocks the NMDA receptor. It reduces brain inflammation and it can, it's been shown to increase glutathione status. Furthermore, it can also counteract vasoconstriction, meaning constriction of the blood vessels, and maintain cerebral blood flow. And this is really important. We need to make sure that there is sufficient blood getting to the brain at all times, especially during times of inflammation, so that we can be clearing waste products and providing nutrients as necessary. Now, if you followed my other videos, you know that I'm a big fan of using thiamine in the form of TTFD. TTFD is a more bioavailable form which readily crosses the blood-brain barrier, gets into the brain very effectively. Now, I've spoken in the past about how uh, thiamine is really, really, really essential in the case of high levels of glutamate. In fact, if someone has excitotoxicity, if they have issues with excess glutamate, there is research showing that megadoses of thiamine help to protect against brain injury. Specifically, one of the mechanisms by which that worked was by clearing excess glutamate. And that's through the enzyme called alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. But clearing excess glutamate, and also it is essential for the production of GABA and another neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Thiamine has been shown to uh, counteract hypoxia, so a lack of oxygen, and counteract inflammation of the brain, and also is essential for maintaining enzyme activity. Now, the enzymes which are involved in energy metabolism can be suppressed or can be inhibited by oxidative stress and inflammation. And so loading the dose, loading the enzymes with extra cofactor can help to bypass this inhibition. And this is what I think the thiamine does. Um, it's been shown in a lot of the research to do this. And so it helps to maintain the consistent um, production of energy, which is there to essentially prevent the cells from dying. Finally, here are my favorite anti-neuroinflammatories. So these have research behind them, which would indicate that they are very effective at counteracting the things that we've been looking at today um, and trying to restore some semblance of balance or some balance in the brain um, after some kind of an injury, even if the injury is ongoing. Uh, first of all, turkey tail mushroom. Uh, it's name is Coriolis versicola, and it has been shown to have power, powerful anti-inflammatory effects in the brain, and it does cross the blood-brain barrier. Lion's mane mushroom, again, this is very effective at repairing neurological injury, reducing microglial activation, but also can promote neurogenesis, the rebuilding of neurons, the repair of neurons, which is exactly what we want in some kind of neuroinflammatory condition. Ginkgo biloba is very interesting in that it can very effectively improve cerebral blood flow, so improve the, the flow of blood to the brain, reducing the lack of oxygen or reducing hypoxia, along with um, suppressing many of the neuroinflammatory chemicals which go along with this. There is an interesting herb which is used by Stephen Booner in his neuroborreliosis protocol, neuroline protocol. That is referred to as guteng. It's another word for this is Chinese cat's claw. Now, I found this to be very effective in cases of neuroborreliosis, um, but this, I think, would also be effective at any kind of neuroinflammatory condition. This has been shown to prevent neurotoxicity, reduce nitric oxide synthesis, which I think is interesting, and also increase neuroplasticity. A final one for the herbs is any kind of berberine containing herb. So berberine is a like a phytochemical or phytonutrient which is found in 
three major herbs. One is called Coptis, another one is called Bari, and another one is called Golden Seal. Really, any of those herbs will be effective, or to use a standardized extract of pure berberine might even be more effective, but it's got very useful uh, properties in terms of reducing the inflammatory cascade in the brain and protecting the neurons. There is one more chemical uh, that I would like to speak about, and this is called methylene blue. Now, I don't really recommend this for many people because it is technically not a nutritional supplement. It's been used as a medication, but it's also... Uh, kind of a research chemical, if you might call it that. Methylene blue has really quite unique properties in that it is a, it's able to replace oxygen in the electron transport chain, meaning that it can, even in the absence of oxygen, the cells can still generate energy as if they had oxygen available because methylene blue was acting as an electron acceptor, let's say. It was replacing oxygen in how cells are making energy, which is quite fascinating. Uh, furthermore, it can dissociate nitric oxide. One of the ways in which nitric oxide damages the cells is by binding heavily or binding tightly to the mitochondria to stop it from working. So what methylene blue can do is it can dissociate nitric oxide from the mitochondria and improve how mitochondria are essentially generating energy. And this is really, really important in the case of hypoxia and neuroinflammation. And so if we can maintain the flow of energy, then we're going to be in a much better position in the long run. And so to finish things off, I have given some example doses or approximate doses of what might be therapeutically relevant. Uh, this is for educational purposes only. So on here, uh, there are some nutrients which I have placed caution next to, and that's because some people have adverse reactions. Uh, one is GABA, another one is glycine. Another one is theanine and another one is methylene blue. The others are relatively safe and well tolerated. It's not replacing the necessity to find the root cause, but it is ultimately giving a lot of extra protection and it's working on all of those downstream mechanisms being the microglial activation, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, blood-brain barrier permeability, neuroexcitotoxicity, depletion of antioxidants. With this kind of approach, one might theoretically be able to counteract some of the detrimental effects of a neuroinflammatory condition. So I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it, please like and subscribe to my page. Share the video if you think there's anyone else who you think might find it interesting or useful. And um, drop me a comment in the comment section if there's anything that you'd like me to do in the future. Thanks and see you next time.